actually going to start this story in German Southwest Africa. Um, in 1904, war engulfed Germany's colony of Southwest Africa, known today as Namibia. Indigenous pastoralists were frustrated by the alienation of their lands to German settlers, and they rose up across the central and southern parts of the colony. The war is notorious for its genocidal conclusion, but in 1904, this outcome was not foreseen. Africans had made very good use of German unpreparedness, and as one historian writes, the greatest military machine in the world had ground to an inglorious halt. In the southern part of the colony, a German farmer named Ferdinand Gessert fled the fighting, taking his herds across the Orange River into what is now South Africa. In his exile, Gessert did not dwell on the conflagration playing out to the north. His mind was on other matters. Southwest Africa was drying out, he said, its water resources vanishing due to a progressive decline in rainfall. This was the real threat to the future of Germany's colony. With the natives, one will cope, he wrote to a German geographical journal. Worse will be the struggle for existence when whites are quarreling with the whites about the desiccating bodies of water. Gessert argued that this dystopia could be avoided by diverting southern Africa's rivers so that they flowed into the continent's interior rather than toward the oceans. Doing so would create large interior lakes. These would serve as evaporation surfaces that would provide atmospheric moisture, which would in turn precipitate as rain. So 15 years later, a South African geology professor named Ernest Schwartz, who was a born to German parents in London and then emigrated to South Africa in the 1890s, presented this scheme as his own. Southern Africa was facing a climatic apocalypse, he warned, in a book called The Kalahari or Thirstland Redemption. Geological changes had caused its water resources to drain away, setting in motion a process that would leave the subcontinent a mirror image of the Sahara to the north, where desiccation had destroyed a fertile landscape in historical times. Like Gessert, Schwartz proposed saving Southern Africa from these forces of destruction by engineering its climate. So assuming that most of you are not intimately familiar with the part of the world that I study, let me just orient us in space. Uh, we are on this continent in the southern part of it, and here is the region that we are talking about today. Um, <clears throat> the thing that is called South Africa did not actually exist until 1910 when it was unified in the wake of the Anglo-Boer War. And I've given you the colonial names here in case I slip up and use them. And the rivers that Schwartz proposed to divert are, sorry, I have a thing here, but are these. Um, so we have here, let me see, which one is it? Yes. Uh, this river, the Kunene, which flows, this is the border actually of Angola and Namibia. And then the Chobe, which is here, which is a tributary of the Zambezi. Now, you will observe that these rivers are not actually in South Africa. South Africa doesn't have a lot of great rivers, actually. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but you can also observe that there are no political boundaries on Schwartz's map, right? So he is basically saying that diverting these rivers, creating dams, will create the shaded areas that you see on the map as bodies of water, basically. Before we get too caught up in how crazy this scheme sounds, I want to note that it had counterparts around the world. Between the 1870s and the 1940s, there were multiple schemes to do exactly what Schwartz proposed doing. It was proposed for the Colorado Desert in California. It was proposed for the Sertão in Brazil. It was proposed for the interior lake beds of Australia, most famously Lake Eyre. I've been told there is still a couple of people in the Australian parliament, parliament who campaign on this scheme today. Um, and most famously, probably for most people, it was proposed for the Sahara, um, first in the 1870s by a French engineer, and then later by a German architect. And the plan was, in the 1920s at least, to put a dam at Gibraltar, Gibraltar lower the level of the Mediterranean, create new land to settle Europeans, and make Africa a continent suitable for European settlement. And you can see this scheme um, you know, floods out most of the people who live in the Congo River Basin, but that was not a Sorgel's concern. OK. Schwartz's scheme also had several competitors in South Africa, where men, and they were always white men, proposed creating rain through seeding clouds, through emitting radio waves, by building condensers on mountains, or by blowing up the mountains altogether. And of course, we are talking today about radical interventions to fight climate change, including adding huge quantities of material to the upper atmosphere or to the oceans. 
As with today's geoengineers, South Africans portrayed their proposed interventions as necessary to stave off disaster in the face of climate change that threatened human survival. Schwartz's fellow scientists were at first skeptical and then openly hostile to his proposal. And historians have ignored it because I think they have seen it as rather, rather bizarre. But you can learn a lot by paying attention to what people are afraid of. This scheme captivated whites across Southern Africa, and it left a paper trail in the archives, newspapers, and published memoirs of five countries. Maybe six, depending on how you count. It was embraced by industrialists, by native commissioners, professors, writers, and members of parliament across the political spectrum. Supporters of the Kalahari Thirstland Redemption Scheme, as it was called, were city dwellers and country folk. They were prosperous farmers, as well as those on the verge of economic ruin. There were enthusiasts in Namibia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. Schwartz had support among both Afrikaners, the Dutch-speaking South Africans, and English speakers, the two groups that had fought each other in the Boer War and were now living together uneasily in a unified South Africa. Schwartz's supporters were diverse in every respect except one. They seemed to have been exclusively white, and possibly exclusively white men. That's something I can talk about in the Q&A. And when they talked about the kind of future that they envisioned, they imagined a green and rain-rich land on the southern part of the continent entirely populated by whites, a radical contrast to the world they actually populated, in which they were about 15% of the population and in which rainfall was scarce and highly unpredictable. <clears throat> Schwartz died in 1929, but his scheme lived on. A reluctant South African government investigated it three times, lastly in 1945, and a group called the Kalahari Thirstland Redemption Society survived into the 1950s. So today I don't want to dwell on whose idea about the climate was right or what the ecological consequences of this scheme would have been. Instead, I want to argue that we need to pay more attention to the diverse ways that people in the past imagined their environmental futures. The intellectual lineage of today's ideas about the environment is messier than we often acknowledge. There's a lot of good historical work that seeks to explore how we arrived at some current state of environmental knowledge, like the greenhouse effect, and then it works backwards to the origins of that knowledge and sort of traces a, a lineage, if you will, without considering the full context in which that knowledge emerged, including a lot of ideas that look you know, quite incorrect and today and based on entirely false premises. What's more, the intellectual lineage of today's ideas about the environment is entangled with a lot of other non-environmental stories. In the case of South Africa, debates over the Schwartz scheme helped to forge a unified white identity, and it helped to sustain an ideal that had been present from the earliest colonization of South Africa, that of an all-white world where settlers would not have to think about the indigenous population at all. As with the history of environmental knowledge, the history of early 20th century South Africa is quite teleological. It tends to work backward from the 1948 election that institutionalized apartheid, the system of rigid racial segregation that was directed by the state. There are countless book titles with variations on the phrase, the rise and fall of apartheid. The public debate over the plan to flood the Kalahari gets us out of this teleological view of history and into the heads of the whites who were the supposed beneficiaries of this march toward dominance. It puts us in the context in which the ultimate outcome of attempts to construct a white dominated society was not yet known and in which environmental threats were seen as a major obstacle, not just to white dominance, but to white survival. There's a growing scholarly literature out there on the construction of transnational whiteness in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but it tends to focus on intellectuals and politicians, and it has little to say about the role of ordinary people or indeed about the role of the environment. Yet the transnational white identity that people explore emerged amid this explosion of white settlement in the 19th century that was almost entirely focused on semi-arid and arid landscapes in places like North Africa, Australia, the North American West, and indeed Southern Africa. Schwartz's scheme generated a lot of written material, and it lets us see how environmental ideas were entangled with racial ones, as well as with populist resentment towards scientific elites, a situation with some striking parallels to the world we inhabit a century later. So let me talk about why this scheme was so popular. Schwartz tapped into several things that whites in South Africa feared, and he offered a solution for each. First and foremost is this rainfall map. 
Schwartz promised to provide predictable rainfall and a lot more of it. As Europeans and their descendants encountered all those semi-arid and arid landscapes in the 19th century, they often concluded that these places had been wetter in relatively recent times. In Southern Africa, this idea of desiccation was reinforced by the fact that the early 20th century was unusually dry. South Africa's white population and its black population as well widely believed that rainfall was declining. Government commissions insisted that the loss of vegetation, the failing water sources, and declining agricultural productivity were not due to the loss of rain, but the result of white settlers' own poor farming practices. Many white farmers ridiculed this expert knowledge. They insisted that agricultural improvements that experts said they should follow were far beyond their financial means and that it would not help them anyway. And they produced their own rainfall records to support this idea of declining rainfall. And I should note that in South Africa, their records went back like 50 years. There was no way you were going to prove this one way or the other. As one man wrote to a farming journal, reports of government experts in this country carry little weight with farmers. They have proved themselves wrong too often. The tenacity of this belief in declining rainfall frustrated government scientists to no end, but they found themselves unable to change it. The existential threat that white farmers felt from what they believed was a changing climate can be seen in countless letters to newspaper editors, farming journals, and government officials. One man told readers of a Cape Town newspaper, the country is as surely being taken away from us as if by the invasion of a foreign race. He added that every farmer who supported Schwartz's scheme was helping his children in the fight they are going to have for existence. Another perceived threat to white's existence was the majority black population, and Schwartz promised to solve this problem as well. White had granted themselves legal ownership of 93% of the country's landmass in 1913, but many fretted that they could not hold it amid changing climate conditions. A Swedish-born engineer wrote, South Africa suffers principally of two diseases, scarcity of water and scarcity of white population. One is the consequence of the other. Across white society, what was known as the poor white problem, um, stay there, okay, uh, was a major political issue. Tens of thousands of whites had living standards lower than many Africans, and this was seen to threaten the mythology of white superiority. An Afrikaner member of parliament, whose party would later institutionalize apartheid, told his colleagues in 1924, in this country, there's a small number of whites against the natives, a few civilized people against the uncivilized hordes. For that reason, it is important that not a single white person should be allowed to go under. But he warned the country was slowly drying up, driving whites from their farms and into a state of impoverishment. And he urged his colleagues to support Schwartz's scheme. Schwartz said that his scheme would create the, prevent the creation of more poor whites by offering rain, a democratic resource available to all who worked the land. In his book, he wrote, everyone in South Africa will receive the additional rain, will see his land rendered more fertile, and all his difficulties from drought, famine, and pestilence disappear. This was heady stuff for struggling farmers, but the increased rainfall would not just stabilize South Africa's racial demographics, it would transform them by opening up tens of millions of acres in the Kalahari to irrigation and ranching. Enough land for all of South Africa's landless whites plus millions of new white immigrants. Schwartz, like many white South Africans, implicitly foresaw a day when modern-day Botswana, Namibia, and Zimbabwe would become part of South Africa, creating a massive center of white civilization on the southern end of the continent. And I should note this was not just a pipe dream. The actual Act of Union in 1909 made a provision for these places to be integrated, including Lesotho and Swaziland, into South Africa. And then in 1915, South Africa was, well, in 1919, it was granted Namibia as a League of Nations mandate after World War I. <clears throat> This abundance of well-watered land, and that's why, by the way, you see no political borders here. The abundance of well-watered land would avoid the dystopia of a resource war between the whites that Gessert had envisioned in 1904. The Swedish engineer warned the prime minister of this same dystopia. The specter of racialism amongst the whites themselves, he said, was the country's major threat, one exacerbated by water scarcity. While the two parties are disputing, he said ominously, blacks would step in and take the land. In the context of early 20th century South Africa, racialism meant Afrikaner versus British. These were the two races in South Africa. But the concern with their demographic status and the specter of drought opened up space to imagine a unified white race that shared this existential threat and kind of started this quest for a white man's land.
that you also see in places like Australia. Using the rivers to the north to change the region's climate promised the future redemption of the unified white race and the securing of this white man's land. And I find the choice of the word redemption to describe Schwartz's scheme quite revealing. In the language of the time, reclamation was the more common way to describe making arid lands productive thanks to the global influence of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. But white South Africans were influenced by a far wider range of ideas than historians have recognized. Um, especially those from America. They corresponded with California rainmaker Charles Hatfield. Lots of them did, and invited him repeatedly to come to South Africa to make rain. They wrote about experiments in the U.S. South using only white labor on former plantations. Indeed, the American South had a particular fascination for many of South Africa's whites. The Swedish engineer asked in a published pamphlet, without immigration, where would the United States be today? In some southern states, there would be a colored majority. When it came to geoengineering and opening up the Kalahari to white settlement, redemption rather than reclamation was the term of choice, a word that also had American antecedents. It referred to the fall of radical reconstruction in the post-Civil War U.S. South, the removal of black political rights and the restoration of white dominance. Schwartz's scheme was not built, and it died a gentle death as South Africa became more urbanized, the climate grew wetter again, and the white supremacist government of the National Party engaged in sweeping policies to allay white fears of black swamping, including the forced removal of and relocation of millions of black South Africans over three decades. Hydro-imperialism, meanwhile, became government policy. South Africa did not divert the rivers beyond its borders, but it did develop them in the quest to secure white dominance in the region in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, you see here a project that was built on the Kanini River, one of the rivers they wanted to divert, um, that was about um, kind of securing white dominance in, in Namibia and trying to make South African claims, permanent claims to Namibia a reality. And also Kahorabasa, most famously in Mozambique, is located hundreds of miles from South Africa, but it was built basically by South Africa with Portuguese cooperation in order to provide electricity to South Africa. But the historical ripples of Schwartz's scheme go beyond what scholars have called South African hydrohegemony. By paying attention to the future that, many, that Schwartz's many supporters dreamed of, one in which lands were made green in order to provide a home for white men, we learned something about how the white minority saw the world around them. When people discussed the future of farmers, of the population of South Africans, they implicitly referred only to whites. White South Africans had no problem erasing the presence of 80% of the population from their minds, a necessary precursor to erasing them physically from the land. This helps make sense of how the promises of complete separation inherent in the ideology of apartheid could resonate with the white public, despite its patent unworkability in a country where black and white lives were deeply entangled. Elements of this worldview remain with us today. In South Africa, a subset of the white population now talks about white genocide and the urgent need for an all-white homeland, and their message resonates with white nationalists around the world. One of the primary promulgators of this is in the photos of the Charlottesville March from a year ago. And beyond South Africa, people are certainly paying attention to the resurgence of the far white right and its racial ideology but they've paid less attention to how this racial ideology has been paired with an environmental one. As in South Africa a century ago, we again see movements that mobilize followers around a combination of disdain for scientists and experts, claims that humans are not responsible for environmental change, and the insistence that white men should get to unilaterally decide what kind of world they want to inhabit. Thank you.